Welcome to the Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. I'm your host, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today, we have Yoan Durat, founder of Ellipsis Investments. Welcome, Yoan. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to get started by giving our listeners the opportunity to get to know you a little better. So tell us, who is Yoan? Absolutely. So um, to tell you a bit more about my background, so I'm, I'm born and raised in France. Uh, I lived in France for several years. I actually started my career in real estate in France about uh, 12 years ago. Um, I was only uh, 18 years old back then. And, you know, I was, I didn't really know what to do with my life. And I ended up in a, in a brokerage um, in South of France. And by speaking with the owner, he told me that I might want to consider a career in real estate. So, you know, I just learned real estate from there. And then I, I really discovered a, a passion that uh, bring me into flipping houses, land development, and ultimately moving here to the U.S. and uh, having a career uh, in the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah. Amazing. And so when you started out your career in France, you did a variety of things, including development. And uh, I, I understand that also involved some work in some historic districts and maybe some multifamily flipping. So tell us about that. Absolutely. So um, as I was saying, I, I started my career as a, as a realtor. And, uh, and from there, we had one of uh, the customer of our brokerage that was uh, very heavy on, on flipping. You know, he was, he was an attorney himself and he was buying a lot of uh, condominiums at auction. Uh, so we were going to the court and, you know, bidding on apartment uh, on auction. And, uh, and he was actually the first one. He was my first mentor and he was the first one to actually finance my first deals. So I started flipping houses with him and flipping condominiums. Um, in, uh, in the south of France, most of the cities and actually the cities I was in was um, at a very huge historical district. So, you know, most of the buildings there, um, you could get some kind of uh, tax incentive if you were buying them in order to rehab them, because obviously um, the government of France wanted to um, preserve this uh, historic patrimony. So, um, you could buy it and basically every money that you would spend on the rehabilitation of the building, you would, you would be able to get it back on your taxes. So uh, I did that for a while and then from there uh, it evolved more into land development. Um, so, you know, we were buying um, land uh, basically and putting permits and all of that and uh, selling those condominiums as new development. Um, so I did that for, for a few years as well before moving here to the U.S. Exciting. And then I believe you moved, uh, was it first to Florida or to Michigan? No, I actually never lived in Michigan. So that's, uh, that's funny enough because I'm known for flipping houses and worsening all of that in, uh, in the Midwest. Uh, but I never lived there. I spent a lot of time. But no, I moved, uh, I moved in Florida and I still live in, in the Boca Raton area in Florida. Um, the reason being like, I mean, I moved to Florida because obviously for the lifestyle that we can get here in Florida, it's a very nice uh, place to live. But as far as a business standpoint, you know, I, I came a little bit late to Florida. So there wasn't that many uh, opportunities anymore down here. So I had to chase opportunities elsewhere. And, uh, and this is all I in the Midwest. Um, primary in Detroit, in the Detroit area, because uh, Detroit was still pretty distressed back then. Now the city is really coming back, but it was a different story back then. So we had a, a lot of opportunities. And, and then from this base in Detroit, I was able to really expand to um, Southeast Michigan, then the entire state. And now we're in the entire state of Michigan and we're in Ohio as well. So, um, yeah. Great. So tell us some of the uh, challenges that you faced developing your career in a new country. Well, I mean, the biggest challenge is, was probably the, the fact that I couldn't speak the language. You know, when I, when I actually ended up uh, uh, for the first time at the Miami airport, um, 
uh, I was in a lot of trouble because I couldn't speak English at all. Like, I mean, my wife was really the one doing the talking. But, you know, yeah, I guess it was kind of a good feeling that I needed to move to this country and, you know, start, start something new here. So once you're forced to do it and you're, you're forced to figure out a way, you, you learn everything uh, pretty fast. So uh, I think that was uh, the first roadblock. Uh, it took me probably about six months to really being able to, you know, um, maintain a conversation and being able to really uh, work efficiently. Um, the second roadblock was, you know, when I moved here, I still, I had a career before in France in real estate. So um, I believe that I knew a lot about real estate and I realized that I didn't know that much because the rules are completely different between those two countries. Um, as an example, what I do right now, as far as wall setting, you know, the fact that when you sign a contract here in the US, you have this capacity to assign this agreement, your right to the purchase agreement to someone else. That's something that is completely illegal in France. Uh, I did that by mistake. <laughs> I didn't know back then, but I tried to do that. And my attorney back, uh, back in the day in France told me like, no, you, are, you, you can't do that. It's, it's actually illegal. And they could come back after you for the entirety of, of the profit on the, on the flip. So. Uh, that's one of the small things, for example, that differ from Europe um, to the US, yeah. Well, now as a wholesaler, that's something that you're doing all the time. Absolutely, it's our main business. So I'm glad, I'm glad to be in a, in a country where it's allowed. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so uh, tell us about uh, finding off-market properties and uh, creative financing. This is what I find to be uh, one of the most exciting things, uh, something you can you can do obviously uh, anywhere, but I think the creative financing is really taken to the highest degree uh, sometimes in the single family space. Absolutely. So uh, the main thing about wall selling in general, you know, we we are not really. I mean, real estate is a product, but we are not really a real estate company. We're more a sales and marketing company. Our work is to market to distress sellers, distress homeowner, find their problem and find a solution to solve it. And then we sell it to an end buyer. So we're already in the marketing and sales. From there, we spend a lot of money on marketing. You know, we have, we have huge overhead on marketing because we have to pull database. We have a call center in the Philippines. We have a lot of very expensive software. We send mailers every month. We, we do a lot of uh, online advertising. So we spend a lot of money in marketing. And the mistake that most world sellers do uh, from what I realize is they only have one offer, which is basically a cash offer. So a cash offer, obviously, if you come and pay cash for an asset, you have to buy it at a discounted price to make sense because you still have to make some money on the flip. And usually as a world seller, you're not the one who's going to do the rehab. So uh, your end buyer still has to get some equity um, at closing. So most of the lead that you generate, less than 5% of them are really going to fit this uh, cash offer, you know, at, I don't know, 50, 60 cents on the dollar or something like that. So this is where creative financing come in play because you can bring a different strategy, you know, for the homeowner who's not going to be um, ready to sell at a discounted price, who wants something closer to the retail price, you can play on the terms and that way you can make some deal happen. So for us, it was more uh, a way to, uh, you know, recoup some of those marketing dollars that we were actually losing. Awesome. So, uh, so tell us then, what, what's the origin story of Ellipsis Investments? So you come here and, and you're looking to get into to single family. Tell you how you got the ball rolling. Absolutely. That's, that's, a very, that's a very interesting question, especially because we're talking about wall setting, but I, I didn't start it in wall setting at all. I didn't even know what wall setting was. Like, uh, remember, like I told you back in the day in France, I tried to wall sell without even knowing the world and they told me it's illegal. So for me, it was something out of the picture. I didn't even know it was possible to do that. So I started actually by flipping houses. So by being, uh, by being born in France and you know having worked in real estate there for a few years, I had a network of real estate broker, attorneys and financial advisors in France. And those people were looking um, 
we had customers where we had a, a portfolio of investors that were looking for um, for investment opportunities. You know, they were trying to get a yield on their on their capital. And the truth is, in France, it's very difficult to find a good return on real estate because of taxes, because of high price and relatively low uh, rent. Uh, you can barely find anything higher than 3% in France. So those financial advisors were looking for opportunities. And that's where I come into play because in the real estate market, especially in the Midwest, we could find um, good properties at a very low price. And comparably, the rents were pretty high. So we could get like an 8 10% cap rate on those, on those kind of investments. So um, I started a turnkey company. My, my, uh, my role was to find assets. We're buying at auction most of the time. Uh, we're buying properties, rehabbing them, finding a tenant, and then we would sell the property to someone overseas and we would still manage the property for them. So it was basically just mailbox money for them. They didn't add to take care of anything. We were setting up their company here, opening their bank accounts. The, the property was fully rehabbed and we were taking care of everything related to the management of the property by itself. So uh, it was a total passive, uh, passive investment. And, uh, and yeah, we, do, we did that for a few years. Yeah, that's just amazing, the sort of yield seeking that's going on in uh, this day and age. Overseas money, in many cases, willing to buy at prices that uh, maybe people around here not willing to do if you have the, the network, the ability to take advantage of it. That's, that's amazing. Uh, now, let, let's maybe move on to a, maybe a different phase of the interview. And most of the people that I interview at some point, they shifted from say a W2 mindset to an entrepreneurship mindset, but you've really always been an entrepreneur uh, since, since your adulthood. Uh, Absolutely. I never had a W2 in my life, yeah. I love it. And so uh, tell us about some of your influences as an entrepreneur. Uh, some of my influences as an entrepreneur. Do you mean like what kind of inspiration? Yeah, like getting you started. So I guess the first one was, I think you said you met a broker and the broker told you that you should be uh, in real estate. Yeah, I, I mean, um, when I was a kid, um, around like, I would say 14, 14, 15 years old, something like that, uh, my my mom was remarried back then. Um, she, she was flipping houses. So uh, small apartment building, I would say like, you know, four plexes kind of, kind of buildings. And the model that she had with, uh, with her then husband, she was buying uh, those buildings, rehabbing one unit, living in there. And then she was rehabbing another one, selling the first one. And, you know, I, I guess they call it now house hacking or something like that. I think there is a term for it, but uh, yeah, uh, back then it was mostly that flipping houses. She was renovating, moving to the next unit. So uh, I moved a lot when I was a kid and, you know, to make some extra money during, uh, during the, the summer vacation, I was actually working on those job sites. I was redoing the roof, uh, doing some painting and stuff like that. So I guess uh, that's how I discovered real estate and flipping. But I didn't really um, saw myself into doing a career in real estate until I met this guy at 18 years old who was a, a broker and is the one who really um, showed me the possibilities of real estate, yeah. Amazing. So uh, as with almost all entrepreneurial journeys, starts with somebody close, usually a family member that, that gets them going. So in terms of maybe some later influences, uh, could you tell us some books that you might have read that helped to forge you as a leader and an entrepreneur? Um, I, I read a lot of books. <laughs> I, would, uh, I wouldn't be able exactly to, to, to tell you which one had the biggest influence. I would say if I had to pick one, uh, which is not directly related to, uh, to real estate, uh, I would say probably traction. Uh, it helped me a lot as far as, you know, uh, the structure of my company and being able to really put in place core values and, uh, you know, um, the real blueprint that we use in our company to grow. Uh, this book helped me a lot. Um, I would say um, um, as far as, you know, more like accounting and all of that, Profit First uh, by Mike Mikhailovich was a good one too. 
Um, what else can I say? Uh, by the same author, there was a there was a book named The Pumpkin Plan, uh, Mike Mikhailovich as well. Uh, this book is really what helped me make this transition at some point from uh, the turnkey business, you know, flipping houses to more uh, the wall selling model. Uh, and then obviously, I mean, all the books like uh, Robert Kiyosaki, um, um, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant, all of that. Um, for sales, uh, I'm a big fan of Chris Voss, uh, Never Split the Difference. Uh, that's a great book as well. Um, 10x Rule from Grant Cardone. Um, it's, uh, I think is probably the greatest motivational speaker uh, out there. So I really enjoy this book. Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, that would be my top. Uh, I don't know many books I gave already, but probably my top five or six, something like that. Yeah, that's perfect. That's already uh, up to a very small business library. So hopefully you find some people to get some uh, inspiration from those books. Those are some amazing books. Well, then tell us uh, what is the next step, next big step for Ellipsis Enterprises? I mean, we are growing already uh, nationwide now. So from, from our initial market in Detroit, you know, we, we grow, as I say, from you know, Detroit to Wayne County, then Southeast Michigan, then it became Michigan, and now we're in Ohio as well. So it's, uh, we're doing currently Michigan, Ohio, Florida. Uh, it's about 20 markets in total in those three states. And then the goal is really to, to go nationwide. So we're going to expand this model in different states and, and, uh, and the company is going to grow that way, yeah. Amazing, and so you've also made the transition personally uh, into the field of multifamily investment. So tell us about what changed for you, uh, whether it was your, uh, maybe maybe your approach or uh, maybe your goals or mindset, what, what did it take to make that switch? Absolutely, so, you know, um, I think wall selling, flipping, all these kind of real estate business are, are very transactional, you know. It's uh, it's basically you still have to chase after, go after the next sale because otherwise you don't have any money coming in. So uh, there is something that really interests me in, you know, creating some some wealth and some passive income at some point. Uh, that's something that I uh, I wish I would have done earlier instead of you know selling everything and being really in this active income. Um, from there, you know, we, we managed a lot of properties back then when we were doing the turnkey business. We had a property management business that I sold now, but uh, we we're managing over 300 units. So um, I know what it takes to manage a lot of single family house. And I realized, you know, back in the day when we were managing all those houses, we had a few apartment buildings and it was just way easier to manage. The reason being, you know, one roof, 20 doors instead of having 20 doors, 20 roof, 20 furnace, 20 hot water tanks, you know, it's, it's just easier to scale. So my goal being to, aside from my active income on the wall sitting and flipping, more like creating some passive income and building a portfolio, I guess the, the best way to do that would be to, to scale on the multifamily. And it's just easier for me to go chase after a larger apartment building than going after a whole bunch of single families. Yeah. Awesome. And then uh, maybe you could tell us about, uh, how about like a, a heartwarming story from your entrepreneurial venture? Like being able to help people, I'm sure that uh, with creative financing, there must have been a lot of people that were in a difficult situation that you're able to, uh, to help them out of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm not for the last uh, for the last two years or so, I haven't really been the one in front of the customer. It's more my acquisition team. You know, now we are we are at a, a scale. We do we do about uh, twelve houses per month. So uh, I'm I'm more in a position now where I'm working on the business and not really in the day to day operation of the business. Uh, but yeah, I sure I sure have some story. I would say that the biggest part of what we do, you know, is being able to to see the change that we really bring to the neighborhood. You know, uh, when I started in Detroit, I remember some areas of Detroit that were really, really distressed. 
And we focused on it for a while, you know, one particular zip code, we were buying houses and then uh, you see the street a few years later and, you know, those, those, those beautiful houses built in the thirties, you know, were like in very distressed shape because no one took care of them for the last 50 or 70 years. Well, you're looking at them now and we, we already bring back life in, a, in an entire neighborhood, which means reducing the blight, you know, it's, there's no, no more hazard for the, the kids and the family living in those neighborhoods. So I, I would say that's the biggest contribution that we bring in those, uh, in those cities in the Midwest. You know, it's, it's really helping bring back those, uh, those, uh, those communities and reducing the That's awesome. I just love to see the revitalization of communities. Um, how about some advice for your younger self? Um, I mean, advice for my younger self, it would be probably what I was saying, like keeping, starting earlier on to, to keep more asset than selling, you know, uh, when I was running my turnkey business, I was buying houses and some of them I would keep for my own rental portfolio. But, you know, when I was low on inventory, it was an easy thing to do to just sell my own. So I haven't really, uh, kept much, uh, back in the day. And that's something that I regret sometimes because, you know, like you have the quick profit that you can make on a transaction by just flipping something right away. But if you look at the long-term picture and you look at like what the price, I know five or six years later, uh, I wish I would have all on more on them. So yeah, we'll probably start, start accumulating more, more properties, uh, sacrifice sometimes a short-term profit more for building the long-term wealth, you know? Great. I love that. I think that's something that really resonates with the multifamily space. You have so many people who are out there syndicating and they're literally forced to sell because the business plan is essentially to get in and out in three to five years. And you don't have the ability uh, sometimes to really build up that portfolio and fully benefit uh, from all that cash flow. Absolutely. And, uh, and this is why it's not, it's not in my, in my target right now. I'm not looking into syndication or anything like that. I'm just building my portfolio of rentals, you know, building my, my, uh, my wealth over time. So I'm just, I'm just using uh, my own capital and I'm raising some money from private investor, but uh, more as a debt investor, you know, like lenders, it's not going to be any equity or anything like that uh, because I want to stay in control of the asset and I don't want to be forced to sell uh, down the road three, three or four years later. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, huge advantage to have a smaller number of investors uh, definitely makes it a lot easier to keep that control and, and to have the, the options and the latitude to do what you want to do. Well, Johan, tell us, um, how can people contact you? Absolutely. So uh, I think the best way will be, honestly, Instagram. Uh, that's where I'm the easiest to reach. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Uh, just my name and uh, my first name and last name, Johan Dorat uh and uh and yeah that would be probably the easiest way uh we have a website as well ellipsisinvest.com um you can find me there and um uh, yeah awesome thank you so much for joining us today thank you so much for for having me i really enjoy this time and uh yeah thank you awesome